Well, good morning, King's Church. Please be seated. I'm grateful to Pastor John for giving me the opportunity to preach this morning. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1, verse 1. Hosea chapter 1, verse 1. And reading through verse 6. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea the son of Beri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, And she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. And on that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel, to forgive them at all. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, as I proclaim your word, as I proclaim your gospel, may you be honored as holy. Father, may this teaching be edifying to the saints and those who are lost, May they be found. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. God calls his prophet Hosea to marry an unfaithful woman named Gomer. And they would be a symbol of God's faithfulness to spiritually unfaithful Israel. So we clearly see that Gomer and Hosea did not have a healthy marriage. What does the text say? She was a wife of whoredom. She was an adulterous woman. In contrast, the Christian couple is called to be a picture of Christ and His church. I believe it will be edifying to the church to explain what Christian marriage is. This sermon is in two parts. Part one is defining biblical marriage, and part two dissecting the text of Hosea chapter 1, verse 6. I would like to start by affirming what a marriage is and what it is not. A marriage is between one man and one woman. It is not between one man and multiple women, nor is it between one woman and multiple men. It is not between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. And additionally, marriage cannot be between a person and an animal. In the Mosaic Law, some types of adultery, all types of homosexuality, and all bestiality were punishable by death. Marriage is not a sacrament like the Roman Church teaches, but it is a monogamous union that is to be protected and honored. It is precious because it was given to us by God. Please turn with me to Leviticus chapter 18. Back to the Pentateuch, Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18 and beginning in verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. 
You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister, your father's daughter, or your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or of your daughter's daughter, for their nakedness is your own nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, brought up in your father's family since she is your sister. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister. She is your father's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is your mother's relative. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. That is, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and of her daughter. And you shall not take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. They are relatives. It is depravity. And you shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanliness. And you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife, and so make yourself unclean with her. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. You shall not lie with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. And the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. Some argue that the Old Testament is outdated, thus not relevant to you and I today. I remind you that the Son is a member of the Trinity. Reading from Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And He said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. In John 8.58, Jesus says, say, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is the I am. So everything from Genesis to Revelation is in full agreement with Christ. Hebrews 13.8 declares, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Indeed, Jesus came to fulfill the law and not abolish it. Marriage is sacred, and sexual relations are to be kept between a married man and woman. We are clearly told in Romans 1 that people are handed over to the sin of homosexuality and lesbianism. Reading from Romans 1, 24 through 27, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty penalty for their error. Christian, we must call sin, sin. 
But we must remember that by grace we have all been saved. So there is freedom in Christ for the homosexual who turns to Christ and turns away from their sin. As well as all sinners, not just homosexuals. All sinners. Marriage is ordained by God in Genesis and reaffirmed by Jesus in the Gospels. Matthew 19, 4-6 through reads, He answered, and this is referring to Christ, Have you not read that He who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Hebrews 13, 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexual immoral, sexually immoral and adulterous. We do not believe that marriage can be redefined because we find our definition of marriage in God's Word. And since the Bible is God's Word and God does not change, marriage cannot be redefined. A common argument in favor of other forms of covenants is that people cannot choose whom they love because love is an emotion out of their control. And I disagree with this. I agree that some people may lust after members of the same sex, but love is a choice. At least the biblical definition of love is a choice. It is a decision. It is a commitment. It would also be wrong for a married man to pursue a woman who is not his wife. Again, love is a choice. It is an action, a mindset, a resolution. If you disagree with me, think about the last time you had a fight or big argument with someone you dearly care about. In the middle of the fight, I I don't believe you wanted to act in a loving manner towards the individual. All feelings of compassion and care most likely left your mind. But true love surpasses emotions. Emotions come and go, but true love is constant. And the most powerful love displayed to Christians is the Father's election and grace, Jesus' life, atoning death and resurrection, and the Spirit's sustaining power and comfort. In Genesis 2.18, God says when referring to Adam, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Scripture tells us that Adam needed Eve even before sin came into the world. Our forefather, the first man to ever live, was originally without sin. But even in this state, he still needed his wife. In heaven, we will not be married. The church, which is referred to as the bride of Christ, will be with God. Reading from Mark 12, 25. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Everything in the physical and spiritual realms has been created by and for God. Every creature is dependent. Only the triune God is independent. One of the amazing attributes of God is the aseity of God. And Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines aseity as the quality or state of being self-derived or self-originated. And also, the absolute self-sufficiency, independence, and autonomy of God. Autonomy is the state of being self-governing. God does not need anything or anyone. Again, every creature is dependent upon God, but God is independent. He is the creator, and He is the sustainer. Before God created matter or the angels, there was only God. The Lord is fully and completely self-sufficient. We are told in Genesis 1.27, So God created man in His own image, in the image of God He created him. Male and female He created them. God displayed His goodness, 
majesty, love, wisdom, knowledge, and power when He made the world in six days. We are told that man is made in His image. Humans have attributes that mammals and other creatures do not possess. A few of these attributes are love, justice, and mercy. Even though Adam lived in perfection, he still needed Eve. When Adam saw Eve, he declared in Genesis 2, 23-24, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Paul speaks of conduct and outward appearance in 1 Corinthians 11, 11 through 12. And I quote, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. If you are a wife, you are called to submit to your husband. And if you are a husband, you are called to love your wife, wash her with the word, and lay down your life for her. Please turn with me to Ephesians 5. This was read earlier in the service. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So scripture tells us, clearly tells us, that marriage is to be a representation of Christ and his church. That's a heavy burden. That is a heavy burden. Men, you are called to represent Christ amongst this wicked generation. And women, you are called to be symbolic of the church. That's heavy. These are actions. Because husbands, you are called to love. And wife, you are called to respect. These are actions and choices. And as many of you well know, sometimes very hard to do. Our love and respect will never be perfect in this life. that we are able to conquer sin through the work of the Holy Spirit. If you are single, you may be called to singleness, though that gift is not very common. To my single brothers and sisters, you should take care to ensure that you honor God with your actions, especially towards those of the opposite sex. We live in a consumer-driven society that says, test, 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 Before you buy, even in relationships. Frequently, the thing that many people call love is actually lust. And when lust fades away, the relationships commonly end. Jim Callahan is one of the elders at Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. He was also my New Testament and apologetics teacher in high school. When I was a sophomore or junior at Phoenix Christian High School, he told our class the following. 
You all want a Hollywood type of marriage. Find someone who loves the Lord. These words are very simple but true. Find someone who loves God. I must remind you, Christian, that our marriages should honor the Lord. Men, we are called to be a picture of Christ, and women, you are called to be a picture of the regenerate church. Reformation theologian Martin Luther wrote the following, the Christian is supposed to love his neighbor, and since his wife is his nearest neighbor, she should be his deepest love. Quoting Paul Washer, when I said yes, to my wife, I said no to every other woman. Marriage was instituted by God. At the beginning of Genesis, we learn that marriage is between one man and one woman. But in our society, divorce is very prevalent. But God's design was that marriage should be between one man and one woman who are wed for life. A married man and woman, as you know, literally become one flesh. Some of you may be divorced or previously divorced or you may come from a broken broken family. Brothers and sisters, cling to Jesus. Find your hope, security, and peace in healing in Christ Jesus alone. Malachi 2.15 reads, but you say, Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Quoting the English Puritan and preacher Matthew Henry, A man's children are pieces of himself, but his wife is himself. As the marriage union is closer than that between parents and children, so it is in a manner equivalent to that between one member and another in the natural body. As this is a reason why husbands should love their wives, so it is a reason why they should not put away their wives. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh or cut it off, but nourishes and cherishes it and does all he can to preserve it. They too shall be one. Therefore, there must be but one wife, for God made but one Eve for one Adam. Some gathered here today may feel convicted after hearing that. Your remedy is Christ Jesus. Turn from your sin. Turn from your guilt. Turn from your pain and rest in Christ. Some of you may be married to an unbelieving spouse and grieve over their state. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. And whether you are a male or a female, be patient and pray for them often. Eventually, Gomer would abandon Hosea and her children. Gomer's sinful lifestyle would eventually catch up to her. In Hosea chapter 3, we see that Gomer is being sold at a slave auction. God tells Hosea to go purchase Gomer from the auction. To redeem her and love her. This is a picture of Christ to the church Do you grasp the goodness and the mercy and the love of God? Please turn with me. Let's go back to Hosea. Please read this with me. Hosea chapter 3. Hosea chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1. And the Lord said to me, Go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her with 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. 
And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. Hosea could have legally divorced his wife, but God calls him to be faithful to her, to display God's goodness to the nation of Israel. And this was a foreshadowing of God's atoning work for sinners. Oh, the goodness and loving kindness of our God. Now look with me back in Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1, reading verses 3 and 4. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. So in Hosea chapter 1, 3 through 4, we are told that Gomer bore Hosea a son named Jezreel. Hosea is the father of Gomer's first child, but there is debate regarding whether Hosea is the father of Gomer's future children. We will now explore these two positions, our two prominent positions. God assigns Hosea's children prophetic names to speak of the coming judgment upon the nation of Israel. The Assyrian army would defeat the northern kingdom of Israel, and the Lord would not spare the northern kingdom because their sin against God was great. The sin of the nation of Israel included the worship of Baal as well as other pagan deities. Also, male and female shrine prostitutes were a part of the perverted cult worship of the land. In Hosea chapter 1, verse 6, we are told that Gomer conceived again and bore a daughter. Let's look at the text. Hosea chapter 1, verse 6. She conceived again and bore a daughter, and the Lord said to him, Call her name No Mercy, for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. The child, the daughter, was named No Mercy. Her actual name in Hebrew is Lo Ruhama. If you're reading from the New American Standard Bible or the King James Version uh, translation of the Bible, you will see that the child's name appears as Loruhama. That's her actual name. The ESV has translated her name into English by using the name No Mercy. Loruhama means she has not obtained compassion or simply not pitied. Ruhama is connected with the verb Raham, which is associated with intimate compassion. It describes warmth shown from a parent to a child. In Exodus 34, 6, we are told that one of the names of the Lord is El Rahum, which means God, the compassionate. Loruhama's name spoke prophetically of God's judgment upon the nation. They would be judged by the Assyrians. God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, through the desert, and into the promised land. God made the former inhabitants of the land fearful, but God would now put dread in the hearts of the Israelites residing in the northern kingdom. The Assyrians were coming swiftly, and they would have no mercy, lo ruhama, upon the northern kingdom of Israel. In Hosea 1, 3 through 4, we are told that Hosea is the father of Jezreel, which we we just looked at. Scripture does not tell us that Hosea is the father of Loruhama, Gomer's second offspring. Many theologians believe that Gomer's second child was not the daughter of Hosea because we are not told that Gomer bore Loruhama to Hosea. In verse 3, the text reads, she conceived and bore him a son. In verse 6, we are told that she conceived and bore a daughter. You see, him is omitted. Hosea is not identified as the father of the second child. And since Gomer was a promiscuous woman and possibly a prostitute or a cult prostitute, many theologians believe that the child's father was not Hosea. This is quite possible But I don't believe that Scripture explicitly tells us that Hosea was not the father of Gomer's second child. What we can affirm 
is that Hosea is the father of Gomer's first child and possibly the father of the second and third. The reason I am sure if Hosea is the father of Gomer's future children is due to a similar structure we see in Genesis. Please turn with me to Genesis 29. Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29, and looking at verse 32 through 35. Genesis 29, beginning in verse 32. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she ceased from bearing. So we are told that Jacob's wife Leah conceived and bore a son. In Hosea 1.6 Again, referring back to Gomer, it reads, she conceived again and bore a daughter. And in Hosea 1.8, when she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. So we see a similar pattern. The major difference between these two families is that Jacob's wives were faithful, but Hosea's was not. Leah is committed to Jacob, while Gomer is not committed to Hosea. Also, Jacob's wives, Leah and Rachel, were competing against each other to have more children by Jacob. In verse 34 of Genesis 29, Leah identifies her first three children as being born to Jacob, while Gomer's second and third are not identified with Hosea. Hosea was called to marry an unfaithful woman, while Jacob married two faithful brides. Hosea's marriage was a picture of God's faithfulness to unfaithful Israel, while Jacob's marriage to his two brides did not carry this significance. I boldly stand here today saying that I don't know whether Gomer's offspring after Jezreel were born to Hosea. We should just strive to be faithful to the text. It's God's word. Travel back with me to the northern kingdom of Israel. I would like to paint a picture for you. This story is not authoritative, and it is also not from the Bible. But I would like to provide a helpful narrative. Picture Hosea and Gomer on a warm, sunny day, standing outside their home. A neighbor approaches from the dirt walkway and greets the couple. Hey, neighbors, she says. We heard the news. A second child. Congratulations. We heard it's a girl. I knew it. Hey, what did you name her? Hosea replies, Lo Ruhama. The neighbor chuckled. (laughs) What did you say, prophet? I said, Lo Ruhama. Hosea responds. The neighbor frowns. No compassion, no mercy. What kind of name is that? First Jezreel. And now, Lo-Ruhama, you sure know how to name them. Hosea, the child's name speaks of the coming judgment upon the northern kingdom of Israel. Repent before the Lord and humble yourself. Hosea's marriage to Gomer, again, was a symbol of a faithful God to an unfaithful people. And Gomer's offspring were given names that spoke prophetically of the inevitable ruin to come. God would have no mercy and no compassion upon the northern kingdom of Israel. And one day, God will have no mercy, lo ruhama, upon the sinner. But you can have peace with God if you turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus. 2 Peter 3, 9 through 13 reads, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, 
not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved? And the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Jesus, the Son, came to earth and lived a perfect life. Perfect life. And our guiltless Savior died on a cross at the hands of sinners. He died in his humanity but never died in his deity. He became the curse for his chosen people, taking upon himself the wrath of God due to his elect. Jesus has risen, and he is coming back again. Sin equaled death. But Christ purchased chosen sinners with his atoning work. No human being deserves God's grace and salvation. It is only through the goodness of God, the sacrificial life, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, and the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Christ's righteousness has been given to Christians, and their sin has been imputed to Him. It's been paid for on the cross. It's been given to Christ. So our only hope is in Christ alone. Will you come to Christ? Let's pray. Father, we come before you humbly. I pray that your people will stand boldly, that we will stand boldly in the face of a wicked generation, as even speaking truth will cost some many promotions, jobs, in the future, maybe their life. Let us stand boldly for you. Let there not be an arrogance or pride in us at all. For by grace we have been saved, so that no man can boast. So Lord, we look to you. And Father, let the saints be encouraged. Let those that are not called your children who are sitting here today, May they be saved. May they understand that one day there will be no mercy for the sinner. But they can find hope, trust, salvation, peace, and comfort in your goodness and your grace, God. We thank you for your love and your mercy. Oh, King Jesus, may you be honored as holy. Oh, Father. Strengthen your church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.